In the last video, I talked about the backstory involved in my life and how I wasn't always on the path I am now. You don't need to watch that video to understand this one, but it does give some context to what I talk about in this video. As well as the fact I will refer back to life events I mentioned in the last video in this one. So the choice is yours. Watch that other video if you want for extra context. It will make this video easier to understand, but it's not entirely necessary. But to make a long story short, my life is on a pretty good path if I don't say so myself. My current path has already shown rewards, so I know I'm on the right track. But it wasn't always this way. For a lot of my earlier years, I had no direction, and I had no clue of how I would turn out. At one point, I didn't even know if I'd finish my degree without being kicked out of my university. So, I just referenced an earlier video, and I said how you didn't need to watch it to understand this one, which is true. Well, the same goes for my current path, which was the video before the prior video, but really briefly, my current path looks like this. A career in accounting, a clear path towards a job as a finance manager, which is like a step down from financial controller, which in some cases is a step down from CFO, all the while being close to getting my CPA qualification, which is like above university slash college in a way, which is pretty prestigious. But it's also like a requirement for becoming a finance manager, which provides even more job stability and higher salaries than common accounting roles. I enjoy the work, office jobs are super easy on the body, and it's also a climate controlled environment. I'm able to listen to whatever I want whilst doing my work, at my current job, I can't work from home. But in due time, I'll be able to negotiate a hybrid schedule or even move jobs that allow that. So in due time, I'll be able to wake up at 8 a.m. and still be early for work since I'll be able to work from the same house I live in. Can't, can't wait. wait! As for money, currently I earn around $111,000 per year between both jobs. I work full-time in accounting and part-time, both days, nine-hour shifts at the supermarket on the weekend. I've had this job for 11 years. I got the weekend full-day shifts by just waiting around and taking those shifts when people left. As you become more senior, you become the better employee by default. Hence, you're the first one they ask when open shifts become available. And I simply just kept getting these shifts after getting a full-time job instead of leaving, like what is the case with most people. Now, based on prior meetings at my office job, I will potentially be getting a raise, which in total will bump my pay to around $122,500 per year from both jobs. I consider this a lot of money. Depending on your location, maybe it's not, but considering I don't live in Melbourne or Sydney, this is pretty good coin. And in fact, I remember doing some mental math in late 2018 when I had my first accounting job. I was trying to work out a path between an accounting job, supermarket job, and personal trainer job that would get me $60,000 per year. And I thought that was an enormous sum of money back then. So I'm possibly on track to earn more than double that. Crazy how times have changed, and obviously this money will only increase into the future. I also go to the gym. Hopefully you can tell. My routine is four nights a week, but often I have something that pops up which causes me to miss a session. And I have stuff like my exam periods, which mean I don't gym at all during these periods. So technically I average around three to four gym sessions a week year round. I'm bulking at the moment, so I'm not shredded, but I'm the biggest I've ever been. And really, I'm only about eight kilos away from being shredded. Sounds like a lot, but I've done eight cutting phases in my life. I'm used to them. I can cull this eight kilos if I want. But currently, I gotta to commit to the bulk. But regardless, I'm substantially heavier than I once was. And in fact, when I started, even if I was quite a bit less than I am now, that would have been more than enough for what I originally wanted. I also have a well-constructed diet plan. I stick pretty close to this, the only time I really deviate is via extra free snacks in the tea rooms at work, or if I go out for dinner. But generally, I always have the same meals each day. Maybe a few extra snacks here and there, 
In the meantime, I'll keep potting away at the gym. As mentioned in a prior video, I also have other end goals in mind for my physique. I also listen to a lot of stock market related content on YouTube each day. I do this whilst I'm in the shower, eating, cooking meal prep, cooking dinner, driving while I'm at work. It's no different from when you'd listen to music or a podcast, but instead I listen to finance related channels on YouTube. I find it interesting and it is useful knowing the plumbing of the financial system we are all under. But this knowledge is also used to make quick swing trades or to pick different stocks for a longer term portfolio rather than just following the general market since it's very possible to beat the market despite what all the other basic investors will tell you. You do need to make mistakes and pay a lot of time debt to the markets first but eventually it'll pay off. Pun intended. It's no different from spending time doing a trade or going to uni for a useful degree. Of course you don't have much to show for it when you're halfway through a degree or halfway through an apprenticeship but once you're done, once you're qualified and once you have experience that's when the results will show. I also have land. I will build a house on it. It's a pretty decent sized house in a good area. I will be able to build more equity in this land due to its size and location which is essentially free money to do with as I please. The larger home size means extra bedrooms. I will have three spare bedrooms. I can rent these out for some extra cash also. This will prove to be my second most valuable asset, right behind my education. Alongside all this, I also have a brand slash business I'm working on, which is what you're watching slash listening to now. So that's my current path at the moment. But it's not as if someone told me this early on in my life. I had to figure this stuff out for myself, slash I came across this path on my own. So, let's go over how I got here. We'll break it down, stat by stat. Career. So, growing up, I knew I wanted an office-related gig, but ultimately, I never wanted to work much. I remember hearing in primary school how some people just trade stocks from their computers at home, and they only work a few hours each day, but they had to do several years of hard study at university first, which put me off. I didn't want to study hard for several years. Yuck. In high school, I remember arguing with my mum at one point, saying I was going to drop out of school and just work at the supermarket full time. Since I liked that job, and it was relatively easy. I did like enjoy some of the work I had, since I got immediate rewards. You get paid each week. But study? You don't see any benefit to that for ages. Younger me didn't like this at all. Give me that instant gratification. Delayed gratification? More like no thanks gratification. Oh brother, this guy stinks! The point is, I liked work, hated study, and the only reason I liked work is because I never had any pocket money as a kid. It's like when you're deprived of something for so long, you finally get it, you want to keep it going. This will be relevant in the aesthetic section of this video. So, I enroll in some business related subjects for my final years of high school. I hated my accounting class, but I really enjoyed my economics class, so that's what I decided I'd go to uni to study. I remember brainstorming with my friend in year 10, before our final years of school, and I'm like, I'll enroll in some global politics and law subject, so that I get extra credit for my university application? Nope. I dodged that hard work. Enrolled in some easier subjects instead. Lazy boy. In fact, I dropped accounting shortly after starting year 12, so I could have an extra spare class instead. I could have opted to drop a theatre studies class I did at a nearby all-girls school, since that's not even remotely related to what I wanted to do. But... Not only was that class super easy, but it had... <laughs> girls. <laughs> Nowadays, I'd never do something like that. Drop a hard, useful subject so I can have more spare time, or so I can interact with girls? Hell no. But back then, although it was a tough decision, it was the best choice for one I wanted back then. And to be honest, it was only a tough decision because I was scared of telling my mum. Yep, 17-year-old is still scared of his mum. Asian parents, am I right? 
In university, things are potting along nicely in 2015. In 2016, I started failing some subjects since I just did not want to study. I just wanted to gym and play video games. In fact, here are some Snapchats from this time period. As you can see, I'm playing quite a bit of video games. I love battling against myself in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. I remember one conversation actually. I was talking to some uni friends. I'm like asking a question relating to the subject slash assignment or whatever. And they're like, maybe if you didn't skip the lecture the other day, you'd have seen that. And I'm like, nah, I was busy or at the gym or something. And they're like, dude, we saw your snap story. We were literally in the lecture whilst you had just recently uploaded a Snapchat of you at home playing video games. I'll try to find the exact snap, but the snap they were referring to was an image of me with Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation whilst playing some Pokemon on my DS. Yes, that's how gamer I once was. I'd play two video games at once, sometimes even three, cause I'd battle myself in Pokemon. So anyway, eventually I do this subject that's all about preparation for the real world. And of the many things we learned in this class, we learned about picking the right career. They never said this word for word, but the gist of it was, you want to pick a career that actually has job growth in the future. This is where I first realized that economics wasn't the best choice. The job growth wasn't declining, but it was stagnant. And most economics jobs were in government, which require good grades, which I did not have at that point, nor did I have any intention of picking those up. But I did realize that accounting had good job growth at this point. That's when I decided to switch majors. And that's why I got into accounting, literally just because there was job opportunities. Since I'm at university, spending my time here, going into debt, ultimately for a better job. So I changed into accounting, despite the fact I hated it still at this point in my life, and I was still no good at it. At the very least, I'm like, I'll figure this out later down the track, but at least I'll have options since the accounting job growth will only continue to increase. So that's how I got into accounting. That's it. No backstory of, oh, my uncle was an accountant, or I was inspired by someone, even though I have no idea how you'd be inspired by an accountant, lol. But anyway, that's literally how I ended up on this career path. Because it had good job growth, and I learned that in an actually useful university subject. Recall that I dropped accounting in year 12 too. Now, the add-ons to this come later, as in the enhancements to the career path. I learned later on that you can do CPA after uni, now, this was after 2017. I've talked about it before, but I went on a study abroad trip in 2017. And the only reason I went was for resume credit. Since, in that same subject I learned about picking a useful career path, I also learned that employers like seeing study abroad trips on your resume. Anyway, found out that I was almost getting kicked out of uni due to my bad grades around this time. I only enrolled in two subjects next semester to give myself more time to rethink my career. In the meantime, I also focused on getting fucking ripped. Since if I was going to be a loser with no career slash education, then I better at least look good. After spending the whole summer break, summer here in Australia is like winter over in Europe slash America, I decided to knuckle down. I sat with a career advisor at uni and they suggested enrolling in corporations law business finance, and income tax law, three subjects I never intended on doing. I had tried business finance before, but since it was a finance-specific unit, not accounting, I didn't have to do this, but I was told it was looked at favourably by CPA Australia. I was going to do some fluffy, easy HR and marketing subjects instead, since I just needed to know I'd passed my degree back then, but the extra useful subjects were looked at favourably by CPA Australia, which I only knew because I went to see one of the business slash law career advisors at uni before the trimester started. So this was in my own spare time. I made a special trip to uni on a uni break to do this. In many cases, career advisors can be useless since they'll just tell you how to pursue the path you want to take rather than telling you to pursue an actually useful career path. 
Example, I had a conversation with my brother the other month. We had my sister's 25th dinner and he went home with me since I drove to the dinner after work and the rest of my family met me there since they were all at home. And instead of going back home in the car with my parents, he went with me. So he was telling me how he was opting for a certain career path and he said that the career advisor at the high school was super helpful in telling him how to go about it. So I started probing him with questions and eventually I realized the career advisor wasn't giving him advice on a good career, they were just telling him how to go about the career that he decided. This is not a bad thing, pretty sure it's their job to help students go into what they want, not to tell them to do something else. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you take all the steps required to get into the degree of your choice, if it's not a super useful one, then it's pointless. So that's what I told him. I told him to look at other options since the job growth in that particular field simply wasn't that great. And even so, that particular field is very vulnerable to AI. And to be honest, I am unsure how that particular field even still exists, since AI and influencers do what that field does but way better and without the huge labour costs involved. So that is to say, a career advisor can help, but in some cases they just tell you how to go about the path you're intending on going on, rather than directing you onto the right path. As is the case with the career advisors I saw at uni. I just wanted to complete my degree, get accounting done with, but they're like, well, CPA is a good thing for you and your career path, and these tougher, harder subjects are better for that career path, so I suggest you do those instead. That's what a great career advisor will tell you. I've mentioned tips on picking a right career before, but I'll make a new quick updated video on it soon. I also attended other workshops during the trimester that went over how to perform in job interviews, how to make your resume, how to make a cover letter, how to make a good LinkedIn profile, stuff like that. I only got the ambition for this stuff after hitting rock bottom. I think almost being booted out of uni was the kick in the ass I needed to take this stuff seriously. So if you're like, how do you find the motivation to study slash work hard in your career slash do all this stuff? The answer is simple, because I never, ever want to have that feeling again. That feeling I had in Denmark in July 2017. That feeling that you may never get what you want. That feeling that your hard work is being wasted. That feeling that you're never going to get anywhere. To hell with that. I'll get another five degrees if I have to, as long as I never have to feel that feeling again. In 2020, elaborated on before, but I lost my second accounting job I ever had. This one hit hard. Spent the next two days in my room eating and watching old Simpsons episodes. So... This means, in 2020, I had a lot of free time on my hands. Since the government had shut off migration, and we had no idea when this lockdown stuff would end, they decided to give financial incentives for particular courses at university, since we would need those skills, and we couldn't migrate them in like we usually do here in Australia. One of which was AI, artificial intelligence, relating to business. So I enrolled in this. There were a few reasons. One to try and subsidize some of the damage on my student debt. Since I failed units in uni, you need to redo them, meaning you need to pay for them again. And if the government is reducing the cost of a $7,500 course slash certificate down to 2,500 bucks, then in a roundabout way, I've just cut five grand off my student debt. Whether you look at it this way or not isn't super important, but it was a good deal to take advantage of. It's a hedge against AI replacing accountants. I've heard of this nonsense before. It's not going to replace us, you morons. It's only going to change our role. But that's fine since the more people that believe this, the less people who will pursue accounting. Meaning, in 15 years, when I'm still employed as an accountant, because AI hasn't replaced us, and there's no other new accountants in the job market to compete for my role, and all the boomers have died off, I can demand higher salaries due to the lower supply of labour. So yes, we are totally being obsoleted by AI. Definitely don't consider a career in accounting. But anyway, it was a hedge against the possible risk of this, but it's also just to learn about AI and its impact on business, which is obviously a good thing to have on your resume. 
especially seeing how AI has evolved in the past few years. And thirdly, I enrolled in this certificate to kill time before Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time came out. If I spent my lockdown time in my home gym, doing supermarket shifts, and playing the OG Crash games all day, the days would drag. If I enrolled back into uni, the time would fly. So that's another reason I enrolled. And it just so happens that the current path I am on now is pretty much a straight line to a finance manager role. I never planned this, it just happened. One convoluted evil plan. I didn't have a plan. All that stuff just happened. But it started by realizing that accounting job growth was projected to increase in the future. So, pick a career path that is good job growth. Or you may struggle to find employment later on, and your wages may be stagnant if there is no increased demand in your field. So, that's basically how I got onto the career path. The motivation came from the fact that I almost ended up being removed from my career. You're going to need some level of intrinsic ambition. I too was once super lazy and couldn't be bothered, as I've talked about before. I'd prefer to play Pokemon slash other video games and go to the gym instead of studying. Nowadays, I'd rather study than play video games. Oh, how times have changed. The key is to realize your life is also a video game, but instead of figuring out which teams I should construct in Pokemon, example, what should my lead Pokemon be? A tank that can set up stealth rocks and spikes? Or should it be a speedy setup? Instead of worrying about this, you should figure out what career you're going to choose. There's no perfect career. The same way there's no perfect Pokemon to lead with in a Pokemon battle. You just have a career, a Pokemon, that suits you best. So, that wraps up the career path. Money. Next up, we've got to have money. We've got to have money. We want more money. We want more money. Now, this is kind of covered in a career, and it'll kind of be covered in the investment section, but I've always liked money. I remember when I was like under 10 years old, there was like this little booklet that showed my long-term bank balance. I can't remember how much I had back then, but it wasn't much. And I remember sometimes I'd open this little booklet and stare at the money I had in my bank account. I only had money due to like birthday money from Nana or something. And this one time I didn't have any money deposited in six months since, you know, I'm a little kid. I can't work and no pocket money from my parents, but I gained 27 cents in interest in the prior six months. And in the following six months, I had 33 cents in interest. So less than a dollar in interest for an entire year. And I would just stare at this for ages. So maybe there was always something intrinsic in me that made me like money. But isn't that everyone? Maybe it's because I had bugger all as a kid so any money I had was mine. Mine, 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 mine. It's mine, 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 mine. But I never wanted to work too hard for this money. Hence the argument I had with my mum once when I was in year 10. I just wanted to work an easy supermarket job. I didn't want to study. Ew. Ew. Although I do remember hating my supermarket job at one point. I remember being all mopey on Thursdays during school simply because I had a three hour supermarket shift that night. Like only three hours. But back then I worked with older girls, like 18, 19, 20, and they hated me. So naturally, I hated work. Nowadays it seems most people like me. So it makes work very enjoyable. But to be fair, I was so shit in my job back then, so I can see why they'd hate working with me. But it's like, you know, give a little bro a break. But anyway, eventually I started to like work because it gave me money. It's an instant gratification type of thing. You work, and within a week, there's more money in your bank account. In the career section, I mentioned how I prefer to go to the gym and play video games over studying. I forgot to mention work. I also preferred to work. In my semester two 2016 exams, the first time I failed three out of four exams, part of the reason was I worked 30 hours at the supermarket job that week. Yep, I decided to go and get 500 ish dollars and it cost me another 4,500 bucks on top of my student debt, as well as a lot of my time redoing those units. 
priorities. But funnily enough, that ended up working out better for my career since if I passed those three units, then I wouldn't have had room for income tax law, corporations law, or my internship at the tax office, since that was like a unit in itself. So if you actually dissect it further, it turns out this was actually a better investment than not going to work that week. Huh. Another butterfly effect for that butterfly effect video I made a while ago. As for the hours I work at the supermarket, currently I have 18 guaranteed hours per week. There isn't much the store can do to change this. Pretty sure they legally have to give me these hours, since I know they would have different hours available if I left. Like I'd have a 1 to 5 shift on Sunday instead of 1 to 10, or maybe an 11 to 4 shift on Saturday instead of an 8 to 5. So originally, I started with a 5 to 10 p.m. shift every Saturday night. I had this for six years. So every Saturday night for six years, I would be working at the supermarket. No parties or anything for me. And this was in like my sort of prime party years of life too, like, you know, year 11, year 12, first, second, third year of uni, even fourth and fifth, but you get what I mean. I'd have to take work off for them, which wasn't super often, or I'd have to rock up late. I remember missing one party I was looking forward to, my friend's 18th, and I was fuming since I knew there'd be hot chicks there. And I just knew that I'd be like the type of some of those girls too, so yeah, I, I was pretty mad about that. And to be honest, I'm still low key seething, but you know, obviously, I don't think anything major would have happened at that party unless I got like, unless I met like a long term girlfriend there or something, but you never know. Anyway, one day in 2019, the store manager at the time hands everyone availability forms and I write down that I'm available during the day on Saturdays. At this time, I was doing personal training at Good Life, and although I had some morning sessions sometimes, I'm like, well, I'm not technically unavailable Saturday. I can work during the day. So, a couple of weeks later, the store manager comes to me individually, and he says, hey, this sheet says you're available during the day. Is that correct? And I'm like, yep. That's why I said I was available during the day. That's why I filled that out, because I am available during the day, question mark. And he's like, did you want to work eight to five Saturdays instead of five to 10? And I'm like, yep, sounds good. Now, this was offered to me since we had a shortage in staff at the time, since someone left. And at the old store, it wasn't big enough to stockpile heaps of staff. So there wasn't that many options, especially in my department at the time. And also, I was one of the better workers. So it was an easy choice for the store manager at the time. Just put me on that shift. So that's how I got Saturday 8 to 5 as my contracted shift. As for Sunday, I had Sunday nights contracted for at least two years. Since I remember working those shifts, Saturday and Sunday nights together. And I also remember working late, then having to be up early in the morning for my corporation's law lecture which is what I mentioned in this video, I also remember not going to any clubbing events on Sunday night, despite the fact that university students got free entry into this particular popular club on Sunday nights. Reason being, I was working. Well, I mean, I could have gone after work, but usually I had some sort of class on Monday mornings, so I would prefer not to be out late. I could always skip this, like skip the class, but I didn't get my license until later in 2016. And later in 2017 was when I decided to turn my career around. So no chance was I going to do anything to jeopardize this for the sake of a few extra clubbing nights out. Anyway, the lady who used to work Sundays eight to five had to take maternity leave for her fourth child. So this other girl took her place and she was like, I don't know, 18-ish at the time, maybe 19, I don't know and she eventually got another full-time job shortly after. Now, she also worked eight to five both days, but dropped these after a couple of months as she was burning out. Guess I'm just built different, hey? Jokes aside, obviously now they need someone to cover these shifts. So without the OG lady doing the eight to five Sunday, and without the younger girl doing the eight to five Sunday, guess who's up next? Yep, me. So that's how I ended up with eight to five Sundays, 
I'm not sure if I also replaced that girl's 8 to 5 Saturday too. I am fairly certain these both didn't happen at the same time, like being offered both 8 to 5 weekend days. But I also think that's why they became available, because that girl dropped a casual. But I swear the timing wasn't the same for both of these days. I can only think that maybe someone else took the 8 to 5 Saturdays in between that girl and myself, but I suppose that's not important since it's not like this is a step-by-step -step foolproof guide to getting more hours at your job. Sometimes you don't have a plan, sometimes stuff just happens. One convoluted evil plan. I didn't have a plan. All that stuff just happened. So anyway, if you're a regular, or an OG, you will know that I once worked 7 to 4 Sundays. How did this happen? Wasn't your contract 8 to 5? Well, at one stage we got a new manager, and we never had a second in charge. The former 2IC left, and the store was in shambles so we couldn't replace it, or we couldn't find anyone to replace it, or the store didn't want to pay for one, so we needed someone to like, I suppose, take care of the stuff in the morning, so that's why I got my hours changed to start slightly earlier, and nowadays my contract is 1 to 10, but I do 7 to 4 often to cover my manager when he's off, but the contract changed since originally, the new manager for the store was stuck on what he was going to do with my hours. Since at the new store, and with the way the new store runs, there isn't a whole lot to do during the day. So, it's like they don't need two people working. So, being the nice guy I am, I offered to change my shift to 1 to 10. So that's how we got here. I also offered to change my shift since I never got any sleep-ins in my old routine. At least now I get sleep-ins on a Sunday, on a usual week. I used to have a Tuesday night shift contracted too, but I had to ditch this when starting my current role in 2021, since it was too inconvenient to get back to the supermarket from my new office gig. Although I could have actually done this, I just didn't realise I was going to be able to at the time of dropping the contract. But it's fine anyway since Tuesday night is now my biggest gym night, and with my studies and brand grind, it's best I don't work an extra weeknight per week. So that's how I got to where I am with money. Always liked it. I didn't always practice delayed gratification with it. And growing up, I never had much. So I never had the need for frivolous spending. And I'm a simple guy. I don't need much. And if you're wondering where all the small money saving tips come from, such as a VPN to a cheaper country to pay for a YouTube premium subscription, cheaper phone plans, higher interest savings accounts, etc. Well, I work in accounting. I kinda have to know stuff like this. So that's a wrap for the money stat and how I got to where I am. Next up, aesthetics. So I was never interested in gym at an early age. Some people were born in it, molded by it. I merely adopted it. I remember when I was 12 to 13 years old, about a couple of seasons into my basketball career, I remember after one game, the coach mentioned that we were going to have our next training session at a gym. And I thought they meant like a gym gym, the one with weights. And I was petrified, since I was a scrawny scrub. I didn't want to get embarrassed by the other guys. However, turns out, they meant like an indoor basketball court. Phew. So, we ball. I also remember in year eight, which was a year after that basketball gym thing, my parents got me one of those machines that were like an all-in-one exercise thing. Never used it until like two to three years later. Funny, because I didn't ask for this. They just got it. Since I know they had a low-key problem with me being so skinny. Question mark? Why does that matter? Why does that bother you? Whatever. Doesn't matter. So in year 10, got a girlfriend, as regulars know, I remember doing a workout once, and that's why I didn't respond to her for a while, as in an hour, which is a short workout for my current standards, and it was a long time compared to how often we just sit in front of our laptops and talk. And back then, I didn't have a smartphone. This was 2012, so I only communicated via Facebook, so that requires me to be on my laptop which I don't have whilst I am spamming random shit on that all-in-one machine thing I got for my birthday a couple of years ago. Anyway, not sure exactly why I decided to work out that day. Yeah, it was only that one day, lol. But the response I got from my girlfriend, 
when I told her that, sorry, I didn't respond because I was working out. Her response was, oh my God, you were legit working out? Smug face emoji. There wasn't many emojis back then. So this one emoji she used was like, I guess the old version of the smirk emoji or hot emoji or horny related emoji. I don't know. The point is she was Myron. And I was like, yeah, I was working out. And she's like, that's so hot. And I'm like, haha, how? I was either being a dumbass or just trying to get her to talk more about how hot it was. Anyway, she responds, it just is. So anyway, a while later, like weeks or months later, I was at her house and her mum mentioned something about working out or bulking up, can't remember, but it was a slight at how skinny I was. I think she only noticed especially since I was wearing an NBA jersey. Normally I'd never wear those, so obviously your arms are showing. Anyway, a little while after that, I recall us walking towards a nearby Macca's after hanging around town, and somehow the topic came up of her mum suggesting I bulk up. And I said something like, I'll do that once I'm done playing through Pokemon Platinum. I already played through it heaps obviously, I just found an emulation for it on my laptop, like using Desume or something. So I was playing through it on my laptop, and what was my girlfriend's response? A disgruntled grunt. Like, not super angry, but she didn't laugh or smile. She didn't think the joke about playing Pokemon over gym was funny. It was clear she was at least somewhat annoyed by my choice to play Pokemon instead of working out. Even though, unbeknownst to me at the time, you can do both. Like, pretty sure gym isn't a six hour per day requirement. And this was when I was still in school and barely worked any hours at the supermarket. I most certainly had time for both. Just goes to show how I was never born into the gym thing. Anyway, we split, aka I get fired from the relationship in early 2013. The 10th of January 2013, if I recall correctly. Since we dated for exactly 9 months and 1 week. If you want to know how I recall this, I've only had the one proper relationship, and it got me fucked up. Hence why I remember the time period we were officially dating for. Shit was burned into my memory. After we split, she gets with this guy who was just a friend, insert massive finger quotes here, and he was bigger than me. Like barely. He's skinny for any regular standards, especially with today's social media around. But since he had some arm definition, some abs and some chest, which I did not have, I was furious, I was seeing red. So, naturally, I got my ass into working out a lot. Eventually, this flame died out after a few months. I was still seething, but I was like just so depressed to the point I couldn't be bothered to work out. Made no progress in 2013. But one day I'm scrolling through Facebook and I see this meme. If swag is for boys, and classes for men, then aesthetics are for the gods. And it was a picture of Ziz. I had never seen this guy before, and I'm like, holy shit, who is this? He looks insane. I tried finding out who he was from the comments and whatnot, but no luck. However, I distinctly remember the word Ziz being thrown around high school in 2011, which was when I was in year nine, which was when Ziz died. And also a lot of Come at me bro, around the lockers. I was like, what the fuck are these cunts talking about? But somehow I string together a picture. I'm like, wait, maybe this is Ziz. Maybe this is the guy those guys kept mentioning back then. So I go into Google, type in Ziz, somehow I knew the spelling, and then I'm hooked. I'm Myron. I want to look exactly like this guy. Since, as mentioned in the earlier videos in this series, I was goofy looking at this point and Ziz looked like a Chad male, so this got me back into the gym. If you've seen prior videos, you'll know I never had my own gym. I had to work out in the home garage, and I had bugger all equipment at this point, and I couldn't go to an actual gym since I live in the middle of nowhere. No nearby gyms for me. We had one in the nearby town, but it was shit, and it was also impractical to go to. Like, no chance my parents would pick me up from that, or drop me off. So I had to make do. Didn't make much progress in 2014, which was when the gym thing slash gym fire started up again. But what this year did 
was instill the gym thing into me. Like, years prior, I just wasn't that into gym, but now I am. So, although in 2014 there was a lot of wasted time with suboptimal training and diet, at least it laid the discipline for future years. Since I know many former gym rats who've just dropped off, perhaps they had different reasons for going to the gym, and those reasons weren't strong enough. Just like them. Get it? Because they don't go to the gym anymore? So they're weak? So they're not strong like their reasons to go to the gym? Ugh, really? I'm clever that way. Anyway, their reasons for working out just weren't strong enough for them to continue on past their early 20s. Perhaps I have this struggle period of minimal gains in 2014 to thank? Who knows? This feeds back into what I said in the career section. When you're deprived of something for so long, I had no money for ages, so now I finally do have money. I want to keep it going. I never had a gym membership for ages. I struggled with that one. So now that I finally have one, I want to keep it going. As for proper training slash nutrition, that became easier as time went on. As I started to use the muscle in between my ears to figure out what I should be doing slash eating slash how I should be training. I remember in 2015 asking Google if working chest two times per week was too much, and if I'd be at the risk of overtraining. Lemaire, of course I know the answer now. The answer is probably not. Depends on volume, intensity, recovery, diet, outside stresses, etc. But back then I was deathly afraid of overtraining, despite the fact my training was horseshit. Little did I know that if you overtrain for one week, your gains aren't going to disappear. But back then, I had no way of knowing this. You kids have it easy these days since you are more than likely going to stumble across a channel like Jeff Nippard or Jeremy Ethia. The bigger fitness channels are good. Back in my day, the biggest channels were shit, like Mike Chang and his fucking towel workouts, LMFAO. So that's how I got onto the aesthetics path. The other shit I do for aesthetics like Botox, Dental, Minoxidil, Laser, etc., came later just due to starting to care about your facial appearance and whatnot. The Botox was because I noticed my face was starting to crease, or my forehead specifically, and someone else at work also noticed, so I'm like, yeah, time to change this shit. You just do your homework on who to go to. But I have a model friend, and she gets Botox too, so I just went to who she goes to. And the laser hair removal was because it was getting annoying as fuck shaving all over twice per week applying all the shaving rash creams, etc. The minoxidil I take was thanks to a video from Men's Maxing. I never realised how easily accessible minoxidil was, so I use it to keep my hairline intact, since my hair carries most of my looks. Longer hair and lean face is literally most of your looks, unless you have a good skull structure like Meeks, which I don't have. I gotta rely on hair and not being fat. But I'm sure most people only care about the gym side of things when it comes to my path for aesthetics. So that's my story of how I got into the gym path. A breakup ignited the spark, but Ziz poured gasoline all over that thing. On to investments. Now this is only a recent thing, as in the last few years. The closest thing I had was in 2017. My gym partner wouldn't shut up about Litecoin, so I got onto that, and it went nowhere. I sold out of this ages ago. I had maybe 500 bucks invested in total, since I didn't have much money in 2017, but that was like it. I also invested in a platform called Plus500. However, this was only 750 bucks and whatever I invested in expired. Apparently you only invest in some futures in Plus500 and not the actual stock, so the position expires. I have no clue. But that's how it worked back then, or at least that's what I clicked on when I was investing. So that money disappeared. Pretty sure I invested in Amazon, since I recall a based Zeus video mentioning Amazon as a good stock. Yep, I used to watch stuff like that. The rubbish of how to attract women, best ways to dress for women, nonsense like that. It can kinda help, but you have to have other features that are way more important. Think about it from a male's perspective. It doesn't matter if a girl wears a really nice dress and acts a certain way. If she's super fat and has abnormally coloured hair, I ain't interested. Women aren't totally different creatures. They function the same way as us men too. 
I doubt they're going to stop being interested in Bailey Smith if he doesn't wear a nice shirt or compliments her dress or whatever those channels tell you. I think I also invested into Bendigo Bank, one of the not big four banks here in Australia, because I thought I was smart investing in something I used instead of an actual good investment. I also remember trying to invest in Danks Bank, which is the Bank of Denmark, since I went to Denmark in 2017. Wow, I'm such a savvy investor, investing in stuff people don't even know exists. Once again, bad investment. I had another experience with investments during my study abroad tour in Denmark that year too. We were having dinner with like all of us study abroad students, and someone brought up stock investing. And this other guy talks about how he reads the balance sheets of companies and determines whether or not they're good investments or not. I felt like a dunce, since I'm an accounting student. He's a data analytics student. Yes, there is some overlap, but shouldn't I know how to read balance sheets better than he does? To be fair, he was a mature age student. He was like 26-ish at the time. I was 20. I knew heaps about investing at 26 myself. But anyway, felt like an idiot since this other guy knows accounting better than I do. He never mentioned any companies he was investing in. And he is kinda a show pony, so maybe he was making up stuff to sound smart. I mean, I kinda do the same thing if I feel like showing off. But generally, I don't make stuff up. I just try to steer some conversations towards stuff like stocks, nutrition, tax, money saving tips, etc. Whenever I feel like being a show pony. Lols. And plus, he isn't wrong. He is correct. Looking at the balance sheet of a company is a good way to be a value investor. But many stocks in the stock market ignore those factors these days. Like Tesla and Nvidia are trading way above their PE ratios. Now, PE ratio isn't a balance sheet item but it's a traditional way to check if stocks are overvalued or not. But yet, Tesla and Nvidia keep rallying despite being so overvalued according to this metric. Hence why I don't suggest people check out the standard investment books. Just listen to the current stuff in the stock market. Since you'd miss out on some good trades if you follow the traditional investment strategies. So anyway, this was probably my first sort of brush with anything related to the investor stat. I once had no idea about looking at balance sheets for companies to invest in them. And look at me now. This investor thing makes up a huge segment of my game of life. The next time I sort of dabbled in investments was in late 2019 slash early 2020. I was doing some work on self-managed super funds, which are like retirement funds you manage yourself here in Australia. Instead of it being managed by a company, you manage it yourself. The rich old boomer clients for the accounting firm I worked for at the time got us to like do the compliance and shit for the self-managed super funds. Anyway, I remember that most accounts I looked at had four main stocks. BHB, a mining company here in Australia. I think this makes up like 10% of the whole Australian stock exchange. Telstra, the primary phone service provider here. Commonwealth Bank, the biggest of the big four banks here in Australia. I think the US equivalent would be JP Morgan and Woolworths, the supermarket I work for. They also own a bunch of other shit, but they're generally just known as the big supermarket here, or one of the big two supermarkets here in Australia. Another common one was West Farmers. They own heaps of shit here in Australia, but the main four were BHB, Telstra, Commonwealth Bank, Woolworths. Now, I thought I was a super intelligent, high-level investor now. Look at me. I've seen all the rich boomers stock picks. Hwe, hwe, hwe. I now have the genius insight into good investments. Now, I didn't know this at the time, and I never actually had this confirmed since I lost that job due to COVID. But little did I know, the reason they held these was for dividends. At least, that's what my hindsight is telling me anyway. Look at the stock performance of these companies. As if you wouldn't invest in America. Their market pumps compared to ours. These four companies, however, provide consistent dividend payments which can be enough to live off if you have enough invested in them. Additionally, the tax laws here in Australia also mean you get a reduced tax bill from dividend payments, generally speaking, as I've talked about in some recent videos. So that's why these boomers invested in these. Safe, steady streams of income that also reduce your tax bill. The next time I had any sort of investment-related interaction was at my friend's gathering during the middle of the 2020 lockdowns here in Victoria, Australia. 
Here in Victoria, Australia, the former Premier, Daniel Andrews, the tyrant, was trigger happy with locking down the state. So during a short window in which we had no lockdowns, my friend had a small gathering since we were allowed like five people over to your house because apparently any more than five causes COVID to kill everyone. And my friend mentioned how he invested like $30,000 into Westpac. This was like more than my life savings at the time. But he also worked the two job grind like I did for a while. He didn't quite do seven days, but he did work more than the standard full-time hours. Plus, he was actually still working during COVID at his office gig. Unlike me, I got fired. Anyway, he was like, well, Westpac is a safe company. It won't fluctuate much. And I felt like a dumbass since I had zero knowledge on investments or anything. And my other friend, who did like marketing and sales or some shit, I don't know, she's got a good job now in real estate development or something but she was saying how Afterpay was a good stock to buy into, and it rallied, and she's like, I told you guys, but I had no clue how to even invest in Afterpay. I barely even knew what Afterpay was. Although she was correct, I'm unsure of her reason. My guess was her reason was because since people are worried about their money, maybe they'll put it into Afterpay, since, you know, I can get this now, and if I lose my job, the debt company is on the hook for it. But I'd assume this would go down if anything, since more people would be more careful with their money around these unprecedented times. Not sure, but even so, although she was correct, everyone was correct. Everything pumped in 2020. A monkey throwing darts at a dartboard to pick which stock to invest into would have been a genius back then. I only realized the stock market pumped in 2020 in like 2021, since other than that, I had no brushes with investments until 2021. Now, the reason I got into investing in 2021 was because with my new job, the one I currently have, I was now on way more money than I ever had before. Pretty sure it was somewhere around $85,000 in total from working the seven days per week. Even 60,000 bucks was considered heaps for me years ago. Now, with inflation, and now that I know what the earning potential is for many people in different careers, this is no longer like an awe-inspiring amount of money, but it's still good. But the point is, since I had so much more money than I ever had before, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I can make more. So I started the classic sus YouTube for good stocks to invest in. You slowly get hungry to learn more. Since by this point in my life, I was no longer lazy with my education, as you can imagine from me enrolling back into university during the COVID lockdowns, no lazy, unambitious person is doing that. So I would just keep watching slash listening to heaps of stock market related information and slowly the algorithm just feeds you more and more. Hence why I know a lot now. I've gathered heaps of sources of information. Unfortunately, when you start the stock market stuff on YouTube, the algorithm suggests the bigger channels to you. And if you've seen this video, you'll know generally the bigger channels are more shit since they are good at the YouTube game, clickbait and all that. Not so much investing, but my thoughts are talked about in that video. So that's my path on how I got into investing. I was never really knowledgeable on it, never really had a desire to learn until I started making more money. Funny how that works. You'd think I would have been into that earlier when I was earning bugger all money. Like I remember my first year of uni, I'd make around a hundred bucks per week, maybe 150 bucks really raking in that dough. In fact, I had to like delay some gym payment when I first signed up since I had around 60 bucks in my bank account. The gym membership cost 55 bucks for the month and the scanner fob key costs 60 bucks. I was like, hey, can I pay the gym membership now and I'll pay the fob key next week after I get paid from my supermarket job since I had at least 100 bucks worth of shifts that week. Going from having to delay a payment for a gym membership in 2015 to having more than 100,000 bucks chilling in my bank account in 2024, how times change if you work hard in the right direction. Now lastly, the brand stat. This is like the investor stat. It's also new. Once again, the idea started when I was making more money than ever before. I'm like, how can I make more? But unlike the investor stat, I never really had brief exposure in my earlier years. 
It was purely 2021 and beyond. The closest thing to creating a brand slash business was during my fitness training classes. They had like a project where you created a social media page on Facebook with your fitness name and whatnot. And I was also thinking of starting a fitness business with my gym buddy at the time, who also did my personal trainer qualification with me. But that's it. The fitness business idea didn't pan out. My original intention was to work full-time in accounting, then work fitness on the weekends. But after spending some time as a personal trainer, I realized how inconsistent it was. And in most cases, you have to pay rent to the facility. Mine was like 300 bucks per week. I thought I could utilize this as a tax write-off, but there's some conditions you need to meet under Australian tax laws before you can offset sole trader income against employment income, as well as the fact that tax write-offs don't work in the way I once thought they did. I always thought it was like totally removing tax, maybe even a possible refund, but that's not the case at all. A tax deduction just reduces your taxable income. So if you have a $100 tax write-off, that doesn't mean you owe 100 bucks less in taxes or you get $100 back from the tax office. It just means instead of paying tax on $1,000 of your income, you pay tax on $900 of that income. So let's say you owe $200 in tax on a $1,000 income. Now you have a $100 tax write-off. Your taxable income is now $900. So now you don't owe $200 in tax on your $1,000 income. You owe $170 in tax on your $900 income. You're spending $100 to save $30 in tax. Never do anything for the sake of tax, since it's all proportional. Utilize tax savings if you were going to purchase the asset slash item anyway, but don't just go to buy a new laptop because you can use it as a write-off on tax. And yes, I was almost done with my accounting degree, and I still thought taxes worked this way, despite doing income tax law. Not sure if I just didn't pay enough attention, or they just didn't dissect it like that. I am fairly sure they didn't just dissect it like that, since this was when I was actually paying attention in uni. But anyway, a failed fitness business was the closest thing I got to the brand stat before 2021. I didn't even have a social media for my fitness business back then. I should have started YouTube and documented my journey and gotten my clients slash consults to subscribe. Although that would mean my identity is compromised. So maybe I wouldn't have done this. So yeah, back to the brand path. Around 2021, you heard everyone and their mother telling you to start a YouTube channel. Problem is, not everyone has anything interesting or insightful to share. That's fine. I just knew I'd have a lot of stuff to share since I had a roller coaster journey to get to where I was at this point in time. From failing many uni subjects, making bugger all progress in the gym, to getting shredded and finishing my degree and a graduate certificate, from being fired from two jobs to now having secure employment, as well as all the other stuff I've learned over the years, I knew I had heaps to share. If I didn't have a lot of knowledge or life experiences to talk about, I could have just spammed TikTok and Instagram, since I hear it's way easier to blow up on TikTok especially. Like, I just post fitness stuff. But I like YouTube better, since you can have some long-ass videos. So this is how I got my life on track. It's not a foolproof blueprint for everyone to get their lives on track. However, I titled the video something like, Feeling Lost in Life? Watch this. This is because I too was once lost in life. Maybe you need someone to relate to, or maybe you need to see someone else turn their life around to give you ideas of doing the same. I turned my career around because I felt the negative consequences of failing. Whether that be almost getting kicked out of my uni degree, or losing two accounting jobs. So nowadays, I have no hatred towards my job. Since, it could be worse, you could be like you once were. Fired. Or, almost not passing your degree in the first place. I have no issues studying, since it's an enormous hedge against losing your job. Yes, my current role is secure, and since I'm not on probation, my employer can't fire me without a huge amount of warning or a severance payout. But if that shit happens again, do I want to end up like I was for most of 2019? Applying to heaps of jobs, going to heaps of job interviews, all that nervousness just to get nowhere? Or do I want to end up like I was in 2020? 
only working 30 to 35 hours a week at the supermarket whilst my fellow university graduates were working from home? Fuck no. So in that case, study. Yes, study can be tedious, but it's a much, much better option than the alternative. Don't believe me? You almost get booted from your degree. You apply for countless jobs and get nowhere. You work your minimum wage job whilst all your peers are getting paid way more in cushier office jobs. Then come back and tell me that work and study is a bad choice. I turned money around since, well, I always liked it. I did have times in my life where I had not much money in my bank. Like one time in year 11, my card got declined for a burger and a Big M at the local shop. It only cost around 12 bucks. Didn't even have 12 bucks in my bank account at 16 to 17 years old. I find it hard to believe most people don't want money though. Like, I understand why you wouldn't want to work hard slash study, but surely you like money. If you don't, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe try growing up without money and sleeping in a shed until you're 12 years old, which is when I finally got my own room inside an actual house. Story for another video. And having zero pocket money and going without a lot of stuff you wanted as a kid. Then maybe you'll have an appreciation for the almighty dollar. The all... Eighty dollar. <laughs> I get it. I turned Jim around due to the classic breakup, but also being inspired by someone else who was also super skinny, a dweeb turned Chad. Jim is usually pretty easy to stick to. Well, I find that anyways. Since once you see results, it becomes an addiction. You do need that initial motivation. I've discussed before, but I used to spend more time watching Ziz videos than actually working out. So, although it's an inefficient use of time, it might be necessary for you to keep going to the gym. And once you see results, then you just start going out of habit. I turned investments around since it's free money if you understand it. It's also just good knowing how the financial plumbing works. And stuff like real estate is obviously important information. Since a house slash a main residence is the main cost in life for most people. I turned a brand around since it's a good potential source of income, but unlike a job, it's way more scalable. But as I've talked about before, how likely is a business to pay off? Not super likely. So have your stable career as your main gig, then work on the business when you can. Despite what all the survivorship bias YouTubers will tell you, you don't have a 100% success rate if you keep trying. Otherwise, every channel on YouTube would have more than a million subs or everyone's dropshipping store would make more than 100k per month in profit, or whatever other business ideas are out there. So that's how I turned my life around, and how I got onto the path I am now. Are there any changes you think you could make to your current path? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, that is all.